What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Gordon Lim was given on March 5th, 2013. Professor Gordon Lim is director of the School of Social Work in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Brigham Young University, a Master of Social Work from the University of Utah, and a PhD in social welfare from the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to joining the faculty at BYU, he taught at Arizona State University and Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Lim's research involves examining policy and practice issues that impact Native American families and children. He is married to Erica Lindgren, and they are the parents of five children. He currently serves on the High Council in his stake. And now we'll hear, have the privilege of hearing from Brother Gordon Lim. In the social work main office of the Joseph F. Smith Building, there is a disability access door that has a self-charging mechanism to open and close the door. We've had this mechanism on the door for over two years. My office is located next to that door, so I am very aware every time the door opens and closes. However, it was only very recently, while I was sitting at my desk in a quiet, thoughtful moment, that the door opened, and as it closed, I heard a unique melodic sound. I was so taken aback that I got up from my desk, walked out of my office, opened the door, and listened again to the melodic tone as it closed. I asked myself the question, why hadn't I heard that melody before? Was that the first time that the melodic sound occurred? My guess is that it's been making that sound since it was first installed. Yet it took me over two years to recognize and respond to that small, soft, melodic sound. It wasn't until I was in tune with the sound that I actually heard it. Brothers and sisters, in my work at BYU and in my service within the church, I've been blessed to spend much of that time working with youth and young adults. As important topics and decisions come up during what Elder Robert D. Hales calls the decade of decision, I often hear questions such as, how can I recognize and respond to the promptings of the Spirit? And more specifically, how can I tell the difference between my emotions telling me what I want to hear and the Holy Ghost telling me what I need to hear? In fact, Elder David A. Bednar, while he was president of BYU-Idaho, stated that this last question was the question that was most frequently asked by the students with whom he met. He said, quote, During the entire time we have been holding family home evenings with students, I cannot remember a single time when some version of this question was not asked, end quote. I'm guessing many of you, like me, have asked this question. How can we tell if we are receiving inspiration from the Spirit or if we are getting a message from our own emotions from an evil source or if we are receiving any pro spiritual prompting at all? While I don't have a complete and easy answer to these questions, I would like to discuss with you some of the things I have learned about recognizing and responding to the promptings of the Spirit. I pray for and invite the Holy Ghost to be with each of us today as we discuss this most important topic. Let's begin by discussing how the Lord communicates with us. When we communicate with Heavenly Father, we do so through prayer. When He speaks to us, He does it through revelation. This two-way divine communication is critical to our understanding of the process of receiving personal revelation. Let's look at this process in action. In section 6 and 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we learn through revelation given to Oliver Cowdery some important concepts in this two-way divine communication. In section 6, verse 15, the Lord said, Thou knowest that thou hast inquired of me, and I did enlighten thy mind, that thou mayest know that thou hast been enlightened by the Spirit of truth. End quote. Then in verse 23, the Lord said, quote, Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? End quote. 
Here we see that after Oliver inquired of the Lord through prayer, that his mind was enlightened by the Spirit, and he was given a feeling of calmness or peace. In section 8, verse 2, the Lord states, quote, Behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell with you, end quote. Elder Richard G. Scott notes that when we receive an impression in our heart, we can use our mind to either rationalize it away or to accomplish it. Together, the, the verses in these two sections teach us that when Heavenly Father speaks to us through the Spirit in its most familiar form, it most often comes to us through our thoughts and feelings. As Elder Packer notes, quote, that sweet, quiet voice of inspiration comes more as a feeling than it does as a sound. The Holy Ghost communicates with our spirits through the mind more than through our physical senses. This guidance comes as thoughts, as feelings, through promptings and impressions. We may feel the words of spiritual communication more than we hear them and see with our spirit, spiritual rather than with our mortal eyes." End quote. Therefore, it should be, shouldn't be difficult for us to understand why we are counseled by our church leaders to avoid anything that negatively impacts our ability to receive promptings through our thoughts and feelings. In the field of social work, we often work with people who are struggling with addictions, including pornography and other addictive substances and behaviors. These types of addictions negatively impact our ability to recognize and respond to the promptings of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, what are the influences in your life and mine that negatively impact our ability to fill the Spirit? And what are the ways we can better understand the Lord's pattern of communicating with us? All too often, we, make, we sometimes make assum faulty assumptions and have erroneous expectations regarding recognizing the Spirit. Let me share with you what Elder Bednar had to say about this. Quote, let me suggest that many of us typically assume we will receive an answer or a prompting to our earnest prayers and pleadings. And we also frequently expect that such an answer or a prompting will come immediately and all at once. Thus, we tend to believe the Lord will give us a big answer quickly and all at one time. However, the pattern repeatedly described in the scriptures suggests we receive line upon line, precept upon precept, or in other words, many small answers over a period of time. Recognizing and understanding this pattern is an important key to obtaining inspiration and help from the Holy Ghost." End quote. Elder Bednar then went on to state, Sister Bednar and I frequently visit with youth who wonder about career choices and how to properly select a school at which to study and receive additional education. Many times a young person is perplexed, having felt as though the answer about a career or a school was, was, was received at one particular point in time, only to feel that a different and perhaps conflicting answer was received at another point in time. The question then is often asked, why did the Lord give me two different answers? In like manner, a student may sincerely seek to know if the person he or she has been dating is the one. A feeling of yes at one time may appear to be contradicted by a different feeling of no at another time. May I simply suggest that what we initially believe is the answer may be but one part of a line upon line, precept upon precept, ongoing, incremental, and unfolding pattern of small answers. It is clearly the case that the Lord did not change His mind. Rather, you and I must learn to better recognize the Lord's pattern as a series of related and expanding answers to our most important questions." End quote. Let me share with you two personal examples that illustrate Elder Bednar's points. Back in 2000, I was getting ready to graduate with my doctorate and interviewing for my first faculty position. I found what I thought was the perfect job, a good school fairly close to home, a creative joint faculty position within the school, and a very prominent company that does great work with American Indian children and families, my specialty. My meeting with the company went great. They were on board and I thought this appointment would lead to all kinds of research opportunities and funding. This job, in my mind, was made for me. 
I prayed, felt good about it, and was moving forward. Then during my faculty visit to the school, things went from bad to worse. My presentation didn't go well. The faculty members didn't seem to like me. And there was just something that was not right. Well, I didn't get the offer. So why is it that after praying and feeling good about this job, things didn't work out? That was a question my wife and I were asking ourselves. When this job didn't work out, the other opportunity I had was to go to Washington University in St. Louis, the top school of social work program in the country, which obviously is a good thing. But their offer was to be the assistant director of the Catherine M. Booter Center for American Indian Studies and a lecturer in the School of Social Work. Although this was a great opportunity, it was not a tenure track position, something I definitely wanted. So we prayed again, moved forward, and took the job. What a blessing that turned out to be. I got to spend three years working with Eddie Brown, the director of the Booter Center and former assistant secretary of interior in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, an appointment our own Larry Echo Hawk later filled. Eddie Brown is probably the most influential American Indian social worker in the country. And during those three years, we were able to travel throughout the country working with Indian tribes and tribal organizations. Those three years provided me with the foundation I needed in order to be where I am at today. As a side note, I later found out that the first position, shortly after 9-11, when the economy took a nosedive was canceled due to the lack of funding from the company for the joint appointment. While it would have started out as a great job, it would have been short-lived. Here is the lesson I learned in recognizing and responding to the promptings of the Spirit. Sometimes what we perceive to be a positive answer followed by a negative outcome is later followed by a new, unsuspecting, better answer or opportunity if we will but trust in the Lord and keep moving forward. The Lord knew what I did not. That first experience prepared me to listen closer to the Spirit the next time, to have an increased level of gratitude for how the Lord works in our lives, and to remember that all things work together for good in the Lord's time frame to them that love God. So in summary, sometimes the right choices or blessings come through promptings that are often not recognized until after they are acted upon and in the Lord's time. Example number two. My wife Erica and I dated for nearly a year before we were married. I don't ever recall receiving a one-time spiritual confirmation that she was the one. However, the more we interacted, the more we talked, and the more we learned about each other in different situations, I received many small, simple, and quiet promptings that she was a special, talented, spiritual woman. Together, all of these simple answers over a period of time helped me to receive an appropriate spiritual confirmation that I should ask her to marry me. That confirmation did not come all at once during a single heartfelt prayer of desperation. Rather, it came more in a line-upon-line, precept-upon-precept manner. Here's another key regarding finding a spouse. Elder Oak states that, quote, If a revelation is outside the limits of, of stewardship, you know it is not from the Lord, and you are not bound by it. I have heard of cases where a young man told a young woman she should marry him because he had received a revelation that she was to be his eternal companion. If this is a true revelation, it will be confirmed directly, directly to the woman if she seeks to know. In the meantime, she is under no obligation to heed it. The man can receive revelation to guide his own actions, but he cannot properly receive revelation to direct hers. She is outside his stewardship." End quote. So just because I received a witness to marry my wife was not enough. She also had to receive her witness independently. I think it took her a little longer to know whether she wanted to spend the rest of eternity with this guy who was pretty average. Now, yours and others' experiences with important decisions may be different. We all know that big answers do come, and sometimes all at once. But those are more the exception than the rule. For our family, the story of the lost binoculars and how our daughter McKenna prayed and knew almost instantly where to find them has become legendary and is used as an example of a big answer to a single prayer. However, we should not 
feel spiritually inadequate or unqualified if we do not receive a big and immediate answer to a request or a plea for, the help, for help the first time we ask. As we think about things we can do to increase our capacity to follow the Spirit, may I suggest a few ways I have found to better re receive and respond to the promptings of the Spirit. First, living worthily invites the constant companionship of the Spirit. If you are not now worthy, repent and become worthy. For those who are endowed, go to the temple, the Lord's classroom, and keep your covenants. I've heard students ask, how can I tell if this is the Spirit I'm feeling? If you are living worthily, Paul's letter to the Galatians tells us that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are all examples of what we feel when the Spirit is present. In striving to live worthily, I am also encouraged by the gifts of the Spirit discussion in section 46 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It states in verse 9 that, quote, they are given for the benefit of those who love me and keep all my commandments, end quote. Well, I love the Lord, but I don't keep, don't always keep all of the commandments. The last part of this verse then adds an additional element of hope, quote, and him that seeketh so to do. I am thankful that as I make mistakes, as I neglect to heed promptings, but as I seek us so to do, a loving Father in heaven and Savior are always there to help me get back on course if I will but keep repenting and keep trying. One night recently, my seven-year-old son was having a hard time and misbehaving, so I sent him to bed a little early. My two boys share the same room, and I usually read to them before bed. That night, as I went down to read to them, I was in a hurry to finish a talk I had coming up in my church assignment as well as being a little frustrated with my son's behavior. So I hurriedly read to them and before leaving, gave my son one more short lecture on proper behavior. During that time, I felt something, a feeling that I should stop and give him a hug and tell him that I loved him. But in my haste and frustration, I ignored the prompting, finished reading and hurriedly went back upstairs to finish my talk. That was a missed opportunity I regret. Thankfully for me, Heavenly Father is patient, perfectly patient, and was patient with me on that occasion. The next morning, as I was lying in bed, getting ready to get up and start the day, I felt that same prompting, give your son a hug and tell him that you love him. This time, I followed the prompting. When he awoke, I called to him and asked if he could come to my room. When he did, I asked him to sit down on my bed. He did so and looked at me and asked, what? like he was expecting to get another lecture like the night before. I said, Hayden, I sure love you and I'm grateful that you are my son. I then gave him a big hug and he got up and left. And a few minutes later, I could hear him, I could hear my son in his happy element making siren sounds while playing Legos. It was nothing spectacular, but it was a tender mercy that I am thankful for a second prompting of the spirit to do what I should have done the night before. Second, sincere prayer invites the constant companionship of the Spirit. President Hinckley observed, quote, The trouble with most of our prayers is that we get, give them as if we were picking up the telephone and ordering groceries. We place our order and hang up. We need to meditate, contemplate, think of what we are praying about and for, and then speak to the Lord as one man speaketh to another, end quote. Another key element in sincere prayer is gratitude. When was the last time you said a prayer and only expressed gratitude? In learning to recognize answers to prayer, Elder Scott said, quote, I have saved the most important part about prayer until the end. It is gratitude. Our sincere efforts to thank our beloved Father generate wondrous feelings of peace, self-worth, and love. No matter how challenging our circumstances, honest appreciation fills our mind to overflowing with gratitude, end quote. Obviously, there are times we need to ask for help and guidance, but I know I can spend more time in my prayers giving thanks. Third, immersing ourselves in the scriptures invites the constant companionship of the Spirit. 
Studying the scriptures trains us to hear the Lord's voice and recognize his spirit. Scriptural immersion provides us with a unique insight into how others received and responded to the promptings of the Spirit. Elder Bednar gave a great CES fireside talk entitled, A Reservoir of Living Water, that I highly encourage you to read or reread, where he talks about feasting on the Word by searching the Scriptures for connections, patterns, and themes. In our church callings, we have a handbook of instructions that tell us how to fulfill our callings. In living the gospel, our handbooks of instruction are the scriptures and the revealed word of God through his prophets. Fourth, service invites the constant companionship of the Spirit. Do you realize that as others are seeking the Spirit to receive answers to their prayers, often the Lord uses us to answer that prayer? We had a Relief Society president in my ward who would often pray and ask, Father, help me to be an answer to someone else's prayer today. Then as she was going to work or coming home, she would drive around the ward enlisting the Spirit's prompting to determine if there was a sister that needed her help. Numerous times as she was driving by a sister's home or thinking of a particular sister, the Spirit would prompt her to stop by, bring dinner, or ask to watch the sister's children. That Relief Society president knew what it meant to follow the promptings of the Spirit and be an answer to someone else's prayer. That is Christ-like service. Finally, taking time to pause, ponder, and listen invites the constant companionship of the Spirit. In our fast-paced, immediate gratification world, we can become so preoccupied with good things that we neglect the most important things. I have found that early in the morning, when things are quiet and my mind is focused, I am most receptive to the promptings of the Spirit. There is a famous social science experiment where participants are asked to watch a video of players in white and black passing a basketball and count the number of passes the white team makes. However, during the middle of the experiment, as participants are counting the passes, a person in a gorilla suit walks between the players and out the other side. I think many of our psychology students have seen this. At the end, the narrator asks how many passes the white team made. The narrator then asks, but did you see the gorilla? This experiment has been done on a number of occasions, and typically about half of the participants are so focused on counting the number of passes that they do not see the obvious gorilla walking through the players. I have to admit, the first time I saw the video, I did not see the gorilla either. Brothers and sisters, are we so focused, so busy, that we neglect the promptings of the Spirit, even when those promptings appear right in front of us like the gorilla? Or when the promptings do come, can we tell the difference between the, prom the, the Spirit's promptings and our own emotions? There is a line from the musical, Joseph and the T Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, after Joseph has been sold into Egypt and put in, in prison. As he is feeling down and hopeless, the narrator sings, quote, Hang on now, Joseph, you'll make it someday. Don't give up, Joseph, fight till you drop. We've read the book, and you come out on top, end quote. Similar, similarly, our Father in Heaven has a plan for us, a perfect plan of happiness. And I testify that as we learn to better recognize and respond to the promptings of the Spirit, we will find answers to our prayers and have increased capacity to know how and whether those promptings are from the Holy Ghost, especially during this decade of decision for many of you. Just like the door leading into the social work office, I further testify that as we learn and understand the Lord's pattern for communicating with us, that those small, melodic tones of the Spirit will, quote, lead us back into His sight where we may stay to share eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. This BYU devotional address with Gordon Lim was given on March 5th, 2013.